The doctors is all new. 24% of couples sleep apart. Can separate beds spice up your marriage? Plus, what are the warning signs your nails may be giving you? This can mean liver problems. This could be a sign of a melanoma. The clues, the cause, the cure, and the brand new alternative to the ER and the doctor. Our nurse practitioners diagnose, prescribe, and treat. Then from bruising. Why this happens and when you need to worry. To your baby's spit up. That's a sign to really call the doctor because it can be an emergency. Coming up right now on The Doctors, where MD meets TV. discoloration, unusual baby spit up. Sometimes these problems are nothing to worry about, but they can also be warning signs of something much more serious. So today, we're letting you know if and when you need to worry about the clues your body may be giving you. But first, even if you're madly in love, a little separate time can be healthy for your relationship. But what about separate beds? I think sleeping in separate bedrooms is not right for married couples. How do you get sexuality if you're not in the same room or the same bedroom or bed? I don't think there's any good reason to be in a separate room. Number one, snoring. Number two, wiggling. I just put a headset on, my iPod, and I just listen to music so I can drown out the snoring. God, the roof's gonna fall down. It's like a truck coming through that bedroom. <laughs> Number three, excessive talking. Number four, bad breath. I'm newly married, so I don't want him to think I don't like him just yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 24% of couples sleep apart. No way. Wow. I like to snuggle. Yeah, I think snuggling is really do that. important. The bonding thing is so yeah. important. I think but it's really important. But so is a good night's yeah, sleep. Yeah, that is. Mm -hmm. So let's move on, because there's another thing where we're comparing men and women. A Colorado group of researchers say that women's hands, when compared to men's, harbored more germs. In particular... Yes. Ha! <laughs> 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 Woo, finally! No, no, we no, finally. finally. What do you mean about us? Yeah. I have to say that this, this study is stupid. We're the men. No, it is! It We're is. The oh, my God. God. How can you oh, touch oh, those? Oh, Ew! Oh, you got some? Yes! Here! <laughs> Woo! Yeah, now, this gee, is wait. why this study is stupid. Because <laughs> why would you say that? First of all, the study only looked at 51 college-age students. So it's not even a good study. I agree. Right? I, I agree. And second of all, the bacteria that's on your skin is really not even harmful. So all this is, does is a study that's detrimental to women and... I'm sorry. It's, it's I remember not, this okay, let's not Lisa, take this study yeah, too yeah, seriously yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> this is a study well, that but showed. You know what? People it showed. Will. It People didn't show more it's germs. It's Actually, what it showed was more germ diversity. Yeah, different types. They were of harmless germs, bacteria, yeah. but there were more types of, of germs. Again, harmless, but there is a theory that maybe the acidity in a woman's hand, but they're not, no, dirtier. they're not dirty. And in this study, it said it may be possibly due to the acidity. It's a theory. It's all based on theories. Yeah. And 51 students, nothing. It's out there. You it's know, just But you drama. have to understand that not every study that shows that, like, maybe there's a little more of this for women means, like, <laughs> you get so upset. But the hands, their Skinny? hands aren't dirtier. Skinny, are you a woman? <laughs> no, if I were, That's if true. I were, I'd be a lot cleaner and probably prettier. Yeah, but right I was surprised they even found that because you, you know, you think women wash their hands more than men, or you're you at least you don't worry about your they're hands. They're theorizing, that it's, due, but they're, they're theorizing that it's due to you know, like makeup and things like that. Fine. It's your purses. Remember, we did that on the show. We had this woman come up and she poured out her stuff. Okay. We tested it. We cultured it. Oh yeah, there's it a lot of dirt wrong. stuff in there. I think. I mean, I, I mean, well, she's pulling out sandwiches and toys. Here's so the thing, wrong, but the study but didn't even show that. that women's hands are dirtier than men's. It right. just showed there's more Any diversity. Any studies where you yeah, try to say variety. that one sex or one race... But they race, weren't trying to do that. They yes, were just looking yes, at... They were. You guys are so stupid sometimes. <laughs> have you never heard? Have you I just love how every time we do anything... I love how every time we're just stupid and... Well, you know what? 
This was a study that just watching you be stupid because I'm talking about sexism. If you set, <laughs> select out a certain group and you say negative things about them without and any And we support, should never study people... the differences between men and women because it's it's sexist. No, but if you I don't understand this is this study, you have separate though, beds. This, yes. Uh, uh, this study, I want to sit next yeah. to Drew today. Germs 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 come over on this side. It's a good thing we got it. A different over. sex up here. I'll tell you that. I have fewer, there are fewer germs yeah, over here, too. This is exactly what I'm talking about. This gave you a reason. Hey, Lisa, we're all on the same page here. Absolutely 100%. But this study just looked at 51 college kids' hands. That's what I'm saying. It's a stupid study. But it's everybody good. take home, Men wash your hands, men or women. That's right. Yeah. Give me a little more of this. <laughs> Should I wash my mouth out with soap, too? <laughs> yes. All right, let's move I want to move on. There's another controversy in the headlines. It's the ongoing debate about, and I'm sorry, Lisa, this is about women, oh, whether or not okay. women well, should bad. share breast milk. Breast milk is best, building immunities against ear infection, diarrhea, and respiratory illness. And with demand for breast milk rising, bootleg breast milk sales are now popping up on the internet. Women are selling their own milk at about $3 an ounce. Seeking out untested donations may not be safe. HIV, hepatitis, and some viral infections can be passed through breast milk. Do you know if they've had past history of drug use? Do you know if there's smokers on the internet? I think that there is a lot of risk. So when we first talked about wet nursing on this mm -hmm. show, mm -hmm. sharing literally breasts with other, you know, other children, like right. Salma Hayek did mm -hmm. when she was in Africa, a, a child took breast milk from her right. breast. A lot of people her, said she was trying to do yeah. something very, very good. Right. right. Um, but there's a lot of controversy mm -hmm. to this, you know. So what? What is your right perspective ways of on doing it? it and wrong ways of and doing Lisa, it. Lisa, you, know? you go to Africa all the time. It's yeah, a, and that's why it's even more difficult. There. It's even more complicated <clears throat> subject than you think because there's there's a lot of women who shouldn't be breastfeeding because of HIV. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one of the most more economical things for mm -hmm. them to be doing as well, and sometimes yeah. safety because of water and things like mm -hmm. that. You know, a formula may not be as good if you use often they don't have a choice water they don't have a choice so there are a lot of complicated issues when you talk about a different country versus talking about other women here using milk banks and things like that so there's a lot of and issues it's important for because some women can't breastfeed you know I, there was a right. woman that had a double mastectomy and and couldn't breastfeed and mm -hmm. so she you know she was able to get a lot of donors to give her milk and but you got to do it right do go through a, a, a milk bank the breast milk bank pasteurizes milk the milk right? right so they get rid of any potential any, infection. Right, infections right. we know about and but the ones we don't know about, too. But some of that pasteurization, you may you're gonna, not, you're not get all You're going to lower the quality of the uh, breast milk. So I'm listening yeah. to you, and as a mom, I'm now really confused. Yeah, I right. can't breastfeed my baby for whatever reason. Maybe there's a, a, a reason. Is it okay or is it not to use milk from a breast bank? Or it's breast okay, milk bank? sure, yeah, it's okay. But I don't think so. What's wrong with well, that? No, I'm really What's confused. I think formula is just as good Especially well, when you start you're to pasteurize that. that. You're, I think you're, when you start to pasteurize no, it, you think there's science, harm to babies who, who take formula? I don't think it's harmful. I'm just saying if you could compare, science shows breast milk is better. Well, but you're absolutely not going to get the 100% uh, an infection or mm -hmm. from any milk that doesn't pass the milk bank, you know, inspection. So you still so you're worried, your baby you're worried about the risk. potential still you're of infection. Still, yeah. and, and believe me, I and worry about sharing about. body fluids okay. of any type, and that's you know. Right. But no so one's going to argue that, in general, right. breast milk mm -hmm. is superior to formula. Right. That doesn't mean yeah. that women who formula feed are doing uh, some... It, it doesn't mean that they're... Breast milk is, is superior nice thing about to formula when the mother doesn't have an infection like HIV or mm -hmm. something like sure, that, which yeah. is prevalent in other countries, right. and mm -hmm. they shouldn't be doing that. And the nice okay. thing about formula, it's come a long way. We've learned how to add some of the important essential fatty acids like DHA and ARA. It's, right. it's really uh, closed the gap. Today's show is all about warning signs your body is trying to tell you. For Pauline, her concern is about a very painful and it's an annoying lip issue. Hi doctors, I get really dry chapped lips and cuts on the side of my mouth and I've been using lip ointments and exfoliants, lip glosses to try to alleviate the pain and nothing really seems to help. What can I do to prevent them? And is it just chapped lips or could it be something more serious? Pauline is here talking about lip cracks. Pauline, thanks for joining us. Sure. You are not alone. We were talking about this before the show. Yeah. 
Anyone ever get those painful uh, cracks oh, yeah. at the corner of your mouth? I used to get that a lot. I think some sun exposure sometimes, it'll do that to you. Well, it's called angular colitis. That's the technical name. It's typically just a lip crack. If you look at this animation, what can happen is right at the corner, you're susceptible to these lip cracks. And of course, when that happens, anyone who's ever had this, it's hard for like them to heal. Cut. It's yeah. like a paper Ooh. cut. It's very irritating. When you have these, you do want to avoid sharing utensils, kissing other people, because there, there is that risk of infection. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing I have to tell you, Paul, if you're getting these all the time, you may want to talk with your doctor about looking at some of your blood levels of things like B12. Sometimes if you have low B12, low iron, that can be a cause of repeat episodes of what we call angular chelitis. Okay. And one other possibility is you want to add things into your diet. Now, Vegetables that you're seeing here, spinach, they're loaded with iron, not as easily absorbed as iron that comes from meat or animal sources. And the other thing is, anyone out there who is a vegan, who doesn't eat any animal products, eggs, milk, you're not getting vitamin B12 in your diet. So you need to talk with your physician about potentially getting yeah. supplemented. Mm -hmm. yeah, good sources there with, you yeah. know, sometimes fortified cereals or fortified uh, soy products for the vegans will work well for the B12 too. Hopefully some useful information. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Coming up, what are the warning signs your nails and nipples may be giving you? We'll help you decipher the health secrets your body wants you to know. And then later, have you ever had a bruise that appeared out of nowhere? You don't even know where you got it from. We'll let you know why this happens and when you need to worry. Coming up. I was getting undressed and I noticed that I had something red on my shirt. I pulled my breast upward and my nipple was bleeding. And later. And the baby's spitting up. Oh, boom. You can see that can actually look like a large amount, especially if it spreads all over the, you know, over the table. But this is actually only, this was less than an ounce. Welcome back. Today is all about uncovering the clues that your body is trying to give you. When our next guest discovered a little blood on her shirt, she had no idea how serious her symptoms really were or how it would affect her own daughter. This all started in July. I was getting undressed for bed, and I noticed that I had something red on my shirt. I pulled my breast upward, and my nipple was bleeding. I ignored it. I thought it would go away. I'd call my doctor. A few days later and scheduled an mammogram. She said we should do a BRCA1 testing on you. It was positive, and there was a very high chance of, that I would have cancer in my breast. And they needed to operate quickly. My doctor said that there would be a 50% chance that one of my daughters would be BRCA positive. When my results came back that I was positive, being a carrier of the gene, it still just didn't register. We have an up to 87% chance of breast or ovarian cancer. I came to the decision or the conclusion to have the mastectomy. I couldn't imagine that my daughter is telling me the same story that I'm trying to get through my head about myself. My doctors, they all suggested that I needed to do a mastectomy because if I didn't have breast cancer today, I would have breast cancer soon. I did some research and found the skin sparing mastectomy. The doctors are able to save a lot of your skin, which would mean there's a, a great possibility of saving the nipple. It's a tough decision. Hi, Princess. How was your day? I just want to be a granny for the rest of my life. Well, it was devastating news for Bernadette and her daughter, Tina, but a good warning for all women. Blood or discharge from the nipples can be a sign of tumors, even breast cancer. Well, we have Bernadette and her daughter, Tina, both with us. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, thank you. So, Bernadette, thank when you first noticed the bleeding <clears throat> coming from your nipple, what did you do? I didn't do anything. I just thought that, you know, it was just bleeding and it would go away. I and just I ignored it. Were you because afraid? It's scary. Is that yeah. were you did um, you just want to ignore it? Were I, you in I denial think, or you just really didn't think 
that it potentially could be something that serious? I think part of me was in denial, and the other part of me just thought it would really go away because I'm very healthy and I don't get sick and I hadn't had a mammogram, and I thought, well, nothing's broken. It didn't hurt. I didn't have any symptoms other than the bleeding. I didn't, I didn't feel like anything was wrong. And I see this very often in, in, in my office. You're not alone. Women who find something and ignore it because they're afraid of what is it going to mean. And, you know, they think it's, it's going to mean the worst. And your doctor actually suggested that you get the BRCA testing, the, the testing for the breast cancer gene, so to speak. Right. There's a history in our family. So they said, you know, we're, with your family history, we're going to do the BRCA test on you. And, um, and then they did the MRI. And then they said, we're going to have to remove your left duct system. Mm -hmm. Now, what went through your mind? Because I know I have so many patients who say, should I get tested for that gene or not? Or not? Because what happens is then you get, just like you were met with, the question of what am I going to do if it comes back positive? And, you know, some women might, you know, do surgery or some women might do medication or some women might not do anything. And, you know, did I that go through your mind? I was not going to do anything because it didn't, still hadn't registered to me what BRCA1 was or what it meant, and I was going to do nothing. But then when you found out that that means that you're at, you're at a 87 percent greater risk of, of developing breast cancer, then, then that hit finally, I assume. I was going to ignore it. I was hoping for the best. I thought it's going to go, it'll go away, it's not me, this isn't me. Um, and that's a total normal first reaction. Yeah. But you don't want to become no. a victim to breast cancer. You don't cancer want to become a victim. If, if you can. And just like you said, you wanted to be around for a very long time. Now, you, you had a different sort of situation. Did you, were you having right. s symptoms, Tina? I had no symptoms whatsoever. But because my mom <clears throat> came back positive uh, with, the uh, with the gene, they wanted to have my sister and I tested because it looked like one of the two of us wouldn't have it. So um, I took the test and it came back positive and I was shocked. Well, I, can, I can only imagine. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, there's no brain upon the mother and daughter and you sort of gave her the red flag to, you know, to, to get tested. Well, when we got tested and her test came back positive, she said, Mom, you saved our lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely did. Because Absolutely it's... did because I mean breast cancer the further along you get and with breast cancer It's early detection is the key or or prevention and we have so few tools except what you're doing and, and it's great that you are you know willing to do something because before the the idea of surgery You know for women was just like unthinkable and that's why a lot of women actually didn't do anything they were they afraid would, or of not get tested because they didn't want to go down that route losing exactly. a body part another yeah. reason and and we're gonna get get into that well, that's one of the reasons why we have you on the show today, because you took matters into your own hands. You were bold enough to get the BRCA1 gene test. You knew it put you at risk. They learned about an extraordinary surgery that would not only treat the cancer, but save the appearance of their breasts as well. We're going to take you inside the OR after the break. And then later, do you ever get unexplained bruises or discolored nails? We're uncovering more of the clues your body is giving you. Stay with us. In a traditional mastectomy, the woman would have a big scar coming across the chest like this, and she would have none of this skin. Anytime, any day, you don't need an appointment to see the doctor. Just log on to Facebook or Twitter and add the doctors to your list of friends. That's when it all starts. The following program contains images of an actual surgical procedure. These images are graphic and may be disturbing. Parents are advised that these images may not be suitable for young children. Welcome back. When Bernadette and her daughter Tina discovered they had an extremely high chance of developing breast cancer, they opted for a very unique type of surgery, a skin sparing mastectomy, and they did it together. We have just started the surgery. Dr. Ronowitz has made the first incision. He's going to take the incision down to the breast tissue, divide the tissue away from the skin, take it all out, reduce the risk of breast cancer. We want to tailor the skin of the breast through the same type of incision that a plastic surgeon would use for purely cosmetic surgery. Basically, 
What it amounts to is shelling out the breast tissue, leaving the muscle on the bottom and leaving the skin on the top. So this is breast tissue that's being removed. We've reduced Bernadette's risk of developing breast cancer uh, by over 90%. She'll be able to wake up in the morning with a clear mind. Dr. Rana was had just finished a skin sparing mastectomy for Bernadette, and now it's time to start the reconstruction with implants. After the breast tissue was removed, plastic surgeon Dr. Joel Aronowitz began reconstruction on Bernadette and Tina right away. We're about five hours into both surgeries and it's gone flawlessly. Bernadette is in the recovery room resting comfortably after her mastectomy and reconstruction. We finished the mastectomy on Tina and now about to scrub up and help Dr. Aronowitz finish the final breast reconstruction. Here's the skin of the breast and we've taken virtually all of the breast tissue. Underneath is the pectoralis muscle. We're just making the final modifications in the skin envelope. We've placed the permanent implant in, and now we're going to remove the excess skin. In a traditional mastectomy, the woman would have a big scar coming across the chest like this, and she would have none of this skin. We've done about 90% of the operation. And Dr. Chopra is assisting me sewing in the nipple, which is the last part of the operation. We're just putting the last few stitches in the nipple closure here. Everything went extremely well. Today is going to be a life-changing day for Tina and Bernadette. We'd like to welcome the very talented surgeons who performed these reconstructions, Dr. Joel Aronowitz and our own plastic surgeon correspondent, Dr. Ritu Chopra. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thank you. So exciting stuff because, Dr. Chopra, a traditional mastectomy could leave a woman scarred, self-conscious, and losing so much tissue that they never even want to be seen again. Absolutely. Most women, when they think of cancer, they're very scared because of the traditional mastectomy. It leaves them disfigured with no skin, and their aesthetic results aren't as great. So it's a huge problem. And you take a look. That's a traditional mastectomy. You can see most of the skin is gone. The nipple areola complex is gone, leaving her disfigured. And, you know, although we have great nipple areolar reconstructive techniques available, it's never the same if you have the original tissue there to recreate, to give back that aesthetically pleasing breast. So how does the skin sparing mastectomy work then? Basically, we're doing the operation, the mastectomy, through the same incisions we would use to do purely cosmetic surgery. So a woman with a small breast, the breast tissue can be removed through a small incision under the breast in the fold or around the nipple. In a larger breast that needs to be lifted and shaped uh, anyway, the operation can be performed through an inverted T type of incision, the same way a breast lift or reduction would be done. The skin is open. The breast tissue is removed by the cancer surgeon. And then an implant or a flap, in this case a silicone implant, is placed within the skin envelope of the breast and the skin envelope is shaped so that the woman can even have an improved skin envelope, an improved shape of the breast after a mastectomy. And one important thing to know, here's the animation the incision is made in an inverted T with a woman with a larger breast, but it doesn't even have to be that big with a smaller breast. Then the implant is placed under the muscle to replace the volume that's been removed when the breast tissue is removed. And the breast tissue, remember, is where the cancer starts. The cancer doesn't start in the skin of the breast. And the skin of the breast, including the nipple, can be spared if the cancer is not close to it. And you know why this is so huge and, and, and your story is just so compelling is because this touches so many women who are trying to decide and, and my mother had, you know, suffered from uh, breast cancer, died from breast cancer. She was disfigured like that picture and it was just traumatizing to her and myself. We would be, our whole family became victims of breast cancer because of that. Um, and watching them go through the pain. But to know that something like that is available if you get tested, because a lot of women, especially if they have a family member who has gone through breast cancer, will not even consider get testing because they don't even want to consider the disfiguring type of surgery. If you have this alternative, exactly. it makes it much more than you can potentially save yourself. That, that um, disfigurement is yes. a huge it's barrier huge to barrier. women going in and seeking treatment. And I think that it's, it's important that women realize that it is perfectly acceptable to be concerned about the cosmetic appearance, about having a natural appearance of their breast, 
despite dealing with breast cancer or the threat of breast cancer. Right. Just because breast cancer hangs over our heads doesn't mean you can't still have a natural appearance of the breast. And that concern should be expressed to your doctor. Mm -hmm. And a woman should be insist upon having a plastic surgeon part of the team from the very beginning so the plastic surgeon can have input about the eventual result of the treatment. So right, tell us about the yeah. Breast Preservation Foundation. The Breast Preservation Foundation was formed by myself out of frustration of dealing with women like this who after the fact come for reconstruction and then there's a limited amount plastic surgeon can do. So we formed this foundation in order to promote this operation which has been shown to be equally as safe as a traditional mastectomy. It is equally safe to have it done this way as have a traditional mastectomy. And it's their, they're right, and they need to know that. Mm -hmm. So Bernie, have, Tina, uh, do you have any words of wisdom to our female viewers? I think that I'd like to just say, you know, insist on it. Sometimes doctors will say, well, we're gonna save your life. Why are you concerned about a breast? Well, because that is part of my life. Absolutely, your life has to continue. And just like you're always saying, it's always about giving women options. Yeah. And this is just a great option. Yes, it's definitely good to know the options, especially when at my age, you know, you have so much ahead of you and um, something like that is very intimidating and really scary. Thank you both for sharing your story with us. Thank you. And, and doctors, thank you for sharing this incredible procedure as yeah. well. We appreciate it. Phenomenal. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yeah. And you at home can learn more about the skin sparing mastectomy and the Breast Preservation Foundation at thedoctorstv.com. From spit up to bruises, we'll tell you when you need to worry. Plus, are you having trouble getting a doctor's appointment? Or you don't have time to go, just need a quick answer? We've got a great solution for you after the break. Lisa, like a piece of delicate fruit, women are a little bit more prone to bruising. That's oh, correct. That, that is true. Yes. Saying. No, that okay. was true. That's, That's, how okay. Okay. That's how I prefaced <laughs> it. <laughs> Today we're filling you in on all the clues your body may be giving you, and our next topic came from ProduceTheDoctors.com. Now, first, we'd like to give a huge thanks to Danielle, who submitted this great question, and we have her on the phone. So, Danielle, what's going on? What's on your mind? Hey, doctor. I can Welcome. be pretty clumsy and bruise easily. I could bump into a doorknob and wake up this huge bruise on my leg. Is there a quick way to get rid of them? And can bruising lead to more serious things like blood clots? Well, we'll answer the last part of your question first. Bruising does not put you at greater risk for blood clots. That's a common misperception. Bruising in medical parlance is hematoma. It's actually bleeding underneath your skin and that muscle belly. That's why it gets all dark and discolored. But blood clots are not at greater risk, Danielle. But what I do have to say is this. Lisa, like a piece of delicate fruit, women are a little bit more prone to bruising. That's oh, correct. That is true. Yes. No, that okay. was true. That's why I prefaced it. That's how I prefaced it. <laughs> that was true. Oh, there we go again. Yeah. That's true. Lisa okay, today. Good. Yes. So you know how fruit can bruise. Women and men can as well. But here's the big thing. Sometimes, Danielle, and everyone in the audience, listen, everyone at home, if bruising becomes a problem, if you notice that any time you hit your arm or leg on anything, you get lots of bruising, it can be a sign of an underlying disorder, either a bleeding disorder, low platelets, anemia, in rare, rare circumstances, even, even blood-borne cancers like leukemia. So again, if it's a significant problem and you're waking up every day with random bruising, you really should talk to your doctor about it. But, Danielle, it sounds to me like you just had your typical bruise that you get after a fall, after a traumatic event. We all get them. First 48 hours, apply cold packs, about 20 minutes, multiple times throughout the day. That will help prevent the bruise in the first place. But, Danielle, if you already have the bruise, this is something.